voice you hear will be an old friend of mine. Meet my friend Joe. A 105 millimeter howitzer named Joe. Joe and I were in the shipping business, shipping high explosives to communist Korea. This was a little service we supplied the infantry. When they got stopped, we got started. When Joe and I got to Korea, everybody was mighty glad to see us. They needed us bad. Back at the beginning of the war, when the Reds had things all their way, our side had few men and even less equipment. They'd run a tank up on an incline so the gun would be at the proper angle. They had to use tanks as artillery. They'd turn a few tanks into a regular artillery battery. They used what they had. But you remember, as the world got wise to what the Reds were trying to do in Korea, our side got more guns, more men. Before long, we could hold our own against anything the Reds could throw at us. We'd built up firepower. Before long, we'd built up enough firepower to drive them back to the 41st parallel. We also stopped the surprise attack of over 500,000 Chinese. Firepower did it. Well, Joe's family grew up fast after the early days. Soon Joe's big family was working on a 24-hour shift. All along the line, you'd find little batteries of guns going about their work. It got so you knew their different voices. But they were all speaking the same language. You see, Joe and I were part of a big team they called support fire. With the artillery right behind the lines and the air support coming in from above. They use napalm, made out of gasoline, very hot stuff. At the same time, the artillery threw in white phosphorus shells. Offshore, the Navy threw its own weight in. The sound of shells going over can be a mighty friendly sound. Support fire thins out the enemy and sometimes there's nothing left but the mopping up. That support fire whistling overhead gives you a chance to move on, a chance to look after the wounded. Artillery fire cuts off enemy supplies. It plays hob with enemy communication. It fights duels with the enemy's own big gun. I soon learned the truth of some things they taught me back in artillery school at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, that artillery fire causes more enemy casualties than any other weapon. Three-fourths of all enemy casualties are caused by the artillery. Artillery is the infantry's best friend. It takes a lot of ammunition. When you realize that one little howitzer like my friend Joe slings out a dozen shells a minute, you can see how much ammunition it takes. You can also get an idea how much stuff is landing on the enemy. We set up right in the city of Seoul for a while. You find the artillery wherever the infantry goes. Pack up and move, sometimes miles away. Perhaps the enemy had dug in behind a hill and we had to maneuver around so we could get at him. Or perhaps some unit was surrounded and needed support fire to clear a path. Or perhaps the enemy was breaking through and chasing us. When night came, we get back to work, all night long. Four hours a day through the long rainy season and when the fog started biting with the winter sleet. Artillery is an all-weather weapon. It's back-breaking, nerve-wracking work with your hands numb with the cold, your arms numb from lifting shells, your ears aching with the continuous blasting. Fire! This constant firing wears out the gun. When a gun becomes so worn it's no longer accurate, it undergoes a major operation by the doctors of ordnance. Every outfit has its name. 
The patient leaves the hospital fully recovered and returns to work. But even when your howitzer's in the best of health, you have to pamper it like a baby, because he is your baby. There's always plenty of polishing and scrubbing and sprucing up. You get to know every mechanical part much better than you knew the family car back home. You get to be a pretty good mechanic when you live with one of these things. An artillery piece is a very scientific instrument. To throw a shell so as to hit a target miles away, that means everything's got to be working just right. The slightest wear can make you miss the target by a mile. They take a lot of testing to make sure you're not wasting good gunpowder. These gadgets can give you the prescription for any sick gun. Now you get to know when you've been around a while that when they start inspecting things very carefully, coming around day after day and making a lot of secret notes, well, something's up. And I do mean up. I felt pretty sorry for Joe. I also felt pretty sorry for me. It started one rainy morning. We were taking off for a mass parachute drop into North Korean territory. Most of us were mighty new to this form of transportation. We planned to drop smack on top of the Reds, 4,000 men and 200,000 pounds of equipment. I wish I was back at Fort Sill just studying about all this in theory. The beautiful rolling countryside of Korea. Rolling. It's some of the worst terrain anybody ever fought in. Each ridge is a Maginot line. Every hill means a major battle. This is what we jumped into. An equipment drop is something to see. Real heavy stuff by parachute. An artillery piece like Joe, for instance, weighs about two tons. It's amazing when you drop a thousand tons of equipment how little the damage is. Watch it sail out. Everything but the kitchen stove. It's okay, though. And now we started getting organized. Three minutes after this jeep left the plane, it was ready to roll. Ammunition was collected at a central point. 105 millimeter howitzer shells for my friend Joe. More heavy shells to lift. Cold metal on cold fingers. Joe had landed very comfortably. Now things started happening fast. We had to move fast before the surprised enemy got organized. But there was also a surprise for us. The Reds were organized. They stopped our riflemen. It was here I learned how much these guys needed me and Joe. Fire mission. Checkpoint 2315, over. Stand by. Group at the fire direction center gets all the information they need. Orders are given. The target is located exactly. Then the battery commander starts to work. Battery adjust. Shell HE. Charge 5. Fuse quick. Deflection 2705. Elevation 676. Higher. Out there ahead of these guns, the infantry is lying flat, waiting while the shells sing past. But ordering artillery fire isn't exactly as easy as ordering a case of beer from the grocery store. It takes skill to lay your shell right on the target. You gotta be mighty careful not to hit your own men. And sometimes they're only a few hundred yards from the target. Also, from the men up front, it's usually a distance of several miles back to the FDC, or fire direction center, the brain of the artillery. Often airplanes are called in to help locate the target. 
The pilots are briefed on the general location. It's up to them to fly over the area, locate the enemy, and radio the position back. Today, these fire control planes are an important part of every artillery outfit. Looks like enemy tanks working their way down through the woods at checkpoint 4-3. An enemy supply dump, an enemy artillery battery. The fire direction center labors over its map. These men specialize in finding needles and haystacks. Checkpoint 4-3. There are many data books and slide rules. It isn't as tough as it looks. Stand by. Coordinates 587254. Scramble. Load up. Adjust elevation. Stand by. Over the heads of the infantry, down on the heads of the enemy. Then after the big guns have spoken... Let's go! Come on! Come on! Let's go! It takes a lot of guys to win a battle. A rifleman jogging ahead, lugging their weapons. The supply men following fast with their ammunition. These men are the end point, the line of support that stretches all the way back to Pittsburgh, Detroit, Birmingham. In this support chain, the position of the artillery is close behind these men, just behind the front. Wherever he goes, the foot soldier sees the signs of the support fire that has swept before him. The foot soldier has a lot to back him up. And without this battering ram of support fire that thins out the enemy and clears the way, he could seldom move. Another burning village. American soldiers passing through. Another little bit of history in a town you never heard of. But I remember this. It was necessary to blast this town so we could move on a little further toward peace. This is the only language any aggressor knows. This is the only way we can tell them it doesn't pay. When we talk loud enough, strong enough, they'll understand. The free world is ready to talk back. Listen. You tell them, Joe. Yes, sir. Artillery's ready. <laughs> 